Today on Under the Big Tree, my first Prism Circuits 4U DIY synthesizer panel. In the early 70s, composer inventor Serge Cherepnin was teaching music at CalArts in Valencia, California. Modular synthesizers were being produced by Moog and Buchla, but the cost of entry was very high, far beyond the budget of students or most composers of experimental electronic music. Serge wanted to create a modular synthesizer for the rest of us and developed a line of circuits with Rich Gold and Randy Cohen. Dubbed the Serge Modular, these circuits had some certain characteristics. They had to be relatively simple to produce, using readily available, off-the-shelf components. They had to be very open and flexible in design, meaning that a single module could be used in many different ways, depending upon how they were patched. And they had to be mix and match, meaning that people could select circuits to create a customized system based on their musical needs. A large part of synthesizer design and expense comes in the user interface. You have to decide where and how to lay out the knobs, buttons, jacks, and lights on the panel, and then have to do a silkscreen pass to apply labeling on the surface of the panel itself. Serge simplified this greatly by creating standardized sizes and hole layouts for the front panels. Holes were drilled in a standardized grid, so all the jacks, knobs, and so forth were fixed to be laid out on that grid. This would give a distinctive, uniform appearance to the layout, and create necessary limitations on how many connections appeared on the front. Every hole counted. Furthermore, the panels were designed to fit into a standard 17-inch rack with a height of four rack units. Again, this standardization and simplification cut down on cost and made it easier to build. So. What to do about extra unsightly holes that were not needed in a panel design. And how to label the system if each panel was customized to the needs of the user. Well, necessity is the mother of invention. And this is where the final masterful design idea was invented. Before putting the knobs and jacks into the panel, a piece of paper was glued to the panel. This paper had the labeling and layout for the modules and covered over the holes that were not to be used. Thus, the Serge paper face was born. This being the early 70s, a rather arcane design vocabulary that reminds me of hieroglyphics were used. Once you got used to it, it was easy to follow, though. Another critical aspect was the use of color coding for the banana jacks. While the designs were specifically meant to create no distinction between audio and control voltage signals, being able to see at a glance whether a jack output a pulse or a continuous signal was quite useful. The idea was a huge hit, and before you knew it, students were learning how to solder and building their Serge kits in the hallways of CalArts. Eventually, Serge left his professorship to concentrate full-time on developing these systems. Over time, modules began to be sold by a number of different companies in pre-built and DIY configurations. In true DIY spirit, these circuits have been changed, tweaked, and improved upon over the decades. I started working with Serge Systems in the early 90s, when I was getting my BA in electronic music from San Francisco State University. They had a beautiful system there, built of panels from Sound Transform Systems, which is the company that Serge originally sold his designs to in the 80s. I loved everything about it. The size, the colors, the banana jacks, and the somewhat inscrutable modules that required me to learn through experimentation. I would work on the Serge system every hour I could book. Unfortunately, the pre-built ones were always out of my price range. And so, decades later, I've been building my system panel by panel from companies like LB Designs, 73 to 75, and Loudest Warning. The latest iteration of these types of modules in this form factor comes from Prism Circuits, a small operation dedicated to keeping these circuits alive and available for the DIY community. You can get circuit boards, blank face plates, and the boats that house them from Prism. Then source your electronic components from suppliers like Mauser and Tata Electronics and build your own paper face style panels. And that is exactly what I did. Here is my first Prism Circuits paper face panel, 
completed a couple of weeks back, after working on it here and there for the last few months. I'd like to show it to you and get into the DIY process a bit so you can determine whether building a panel like this is right for you. I chose modules for a panel that would complement my five existing Serge panels. I wanted circuits that I didn't already have and circuits that concentrated on CV rather than audio processing. I only had a digital noise source in my system and very little randomization and only one filter. And you can never have enough VCAs. So that led me to choose the following complement of modules. A five channel programmer, i.e. sequencer, a bidirectional router, a sequential switch, a noise source, a 73 filter, and a gate. That ended up taking 16 columns of holes, which filled the panel. I also got a power supply PCB that I didn't end up using. I got the PCB boards, the blank panel, and the boat. The first order of business was to order the components. I had the basics of resistors, banana jacks, IC sockets, and some common capacitors and ICs. But I had to order most of the components, which I did in several stages for Mauser and Tata Electronics. The pandemic and supply chain shortages led to many components being out of stock at Mauser, and I ended up sourcing a few hard-to-find components from eBay and my local electronics supply store. One of the benefits of living in Los Angeles is that there actually still is a local electronics supply store, All Electronics, in Van Nuys, California. Stuffing the PCBs was a straightforward process. Everything is through-hole, so I started with resistors and diodes, then capacitors and IC sockets, then switches, knobs, and miscellany. The process took months because of challenges in ordering a few of the components, but I wasn't in any hurry, and I just took my time putting them together. I had built a linear power supply for various panels, and so I used that for power in this panel as well. Prism sells a power supply board that works with an off-the-shelf DC power supply, but I didn't need it, and replaced it with a simple power distribution PCB from C. Lee Electronics instead. I soldered wire with the requisite female power connections to that board, and soldered the male power connection jacks to the PCBs. That then left me with figuring out the paper face itself. Fortunately, we have some digital tools that were not available in the early 70s. I downloaded PDFs of the various module faces from the Prism Circuits website, then put them all together into a single file in Photoshop. I took the file to a local printer, and after fooling around a little bit adjusting the size, they printed it to a single glossy sticker page that was bigger than the panel itself, thus only requiring a single page. I trimmed it carefully, lined it up with the holes, and applied the sticker to the panel. I messed it up a bit and caused a bit of wrinkling on one side, but I learned from it and won't make the same mistake next time. It also adds to the DIY charm. With the paper face in place, it was time to populate the panel with the banana jacks and LEDs. There is very little wiring for the Prism Circuit PCBs, except for the programmer, which required wiring all the stages together and then to the master programmer module. Modern day banana jack designs have the banana jack poke through the PCB. You then use a resistor leg to solder a connection from a spot on the PCB near the jack to the metal lug of the jack itself. It is very quick and easy, and if you have to remove a PCB for any reason, it's a quick job to unsolder those connections. Installing the LEDs is a bit trickier and requires some forethought, so you'll want to make sure the PCB is working as well as you can before soldering in the LEDs. As with any DIY project, you'll want to make sure that there are no solder bridges and that all electrolytic capacitors, diodes, LEDs, and ICs are oriented correctly. You can test the PCBs before installing them into the front panel by hooking them up to the power supply and probing with an oscilloscope. You always want to make sure that the ICs you are using are receiving the power you expect and that everything is working as best as you can verify before installing into the panel. Almost all of my PCBs worked perfectly the first time and Prism helped me answer a couple of questions about one module I was having a bit of trouble with. Everything works wonderfully, and it is a great addition to my Serge system. Now, I'd like to take you through a demonstration of each of the modules.
Okay, let's start with the biggest module on the panel, and that is the programmer, which is essentially a sequencer. Now, the way that these systems work is that you have a number of channels, and then you have a two-space master section here. What's interesting is that you can configure it to be as many channels as you want. So since the panel has 16 columns, and two of them are taken up by the master section, that means that you could have as many as 14 channels here. Uh, I chose five channels. Now let's go through what all the knobs and jacks mean. So there are three separate channels of voltage control. So at every step along the way, three different voltages that you can specify are being output from these master channel outputs here. The sequencer is controlled by applying pulses to the down and the up jacks here. Applying a pulse to the up jack moves the sequencer this way, and applying a pulse to the down jack moves it the other way. You can have pulses going into both of them and they can fight it out. Now in this terminology, blue stands for a control voltage and red stands for a pulse. So we have these pulse inputs down here, and then up here, every time one of these channels gets triggered, a pulse goes out of the appropriate jack up here. These two should actually be red as well. I made a mistake when building it because these are master pulses, which means that every time the sequencer moves one way or the other, a pulse is output from one of these two as well. These blue ones are the control voltages, and these are just simple duplicates. When you have a couple of jacks with a line between them, that just means it's coming out of both of them for convenience sake. I'm going to take a, a square wave pulse and put it into the up, and you can see that it is moving to the right through the sequence. If I take it and put it into the down, then you'll see that it's moving to the left. Simple. Now. Now here along the bottom, we have a series of push buttons, one for each step, and holding down the push button will automatically move to that step and stay there as long as you are holding it down. So this is also very useful for being able to set up a set of different pre-programmed control voltages and without actually moving the sequencer forward, these are almost like presets. You could go along and select a different set of three control voltages coming out of the various channels at that point. So let's actually hear this in action. We'll start with the obvious choice. We'll just grab an oscillator. And then we'll grab the output of one of the channels, run it into the frequency input, pitch input of the channel of the oscillator, and then go along here. exactly what you'd expect. And if we go the other way, it reverses the sequence. And if we push the buttons, it stays on that particular pitch. Now we can use these control voltages for all sorts of things other than just pitches. So although we'll get into it a little bit more separately, let's now take the oscillator and we'll run it into the filter and then use a second channel to control the filter cutoff. And then we can adjust the timbre of it a little bit differently as well. So now we've got the filtered output going into a triple wave shaper, and we can go and vary the amount of wave shaping also by using these. So it's good to remember that these voltage control sources are for all sorts of things. They're not just uh, for, for pitch. So next up, let's look at our pulse outputs. So I have now taken the audio output and run it into the gate here, which we'll take a look at in a minute. Um, and we are going to control it with an envelope. 
So the envelope is also off camera. It's controlling the control voltage input of the gate. And if we go over here, and we plug it in here, we can see that it outputs a pulse to the ADSR every time that we get to that stage. Same thing here. And if we plug in over here, it'll trigger every time it goes to any stage. Now when we manually select a channel, it'll continuously send pulse outputs every time it gets a clock input. And so finally, let's take a look at these pulse inputs. So I'm going to take the pulse output of our little clock, and as I plug it in to the various channels, it tells it go to that channel. So we can do it manually, or we can do it using a pulse. Okay, now we're going to take a look at the bidirectional router. Now the bidirectional router is simply a switch. You have two signals that either come in or out, and then this switch here makes the decision of which of these to route either out or in to the other jack, to the B jack. Now the reason I'm being a little bit cagey about that is because these can be either inputs or outputs. So you could have the output of a signal coming in here, and then one of the two of those will go out here to be able to, to go on for further processing. Or you could have two outputs here and an input going in to the B section to be able to decide which of these two then goes off for further processing. So again, the reason they call it a bidirectional router is that A1 and A2 can either be inputs or outputs. And whichever they are, then the B has to be the opposite. So maybe a little clearer to actually see what it's doing. So I'm going to take uh, the pink noise output of our noise generator here and run it into the filter. And then I'm going to take the low pass output of the filter and I'm going to run it into A1. And if we listen, if we plug that into the mixer, by going to B, we can hear that there is our low pass output. So then we're going to take the high pass output and plug it into the other switch, into A2. Now we're still listening to the low pass output because nothing is driving the decider to, to, turn, to determine whether A1 or A2 is going to the B output. So let's use a pulse and we'll plug it into there. And now it's going back and forth between the high pass and the low pass versions of the, of the noise. So we can speed it up. Slow it down. It sounds like one of those sprinklers. And we can listen. If we pull out the low pass, we can hear there's just the high pass going, and vice versa. So it's a very useful little simple utility device to be able to send a couple of different signals in a couple of different places, and there are three of them. Okay, the next module we're going to look at here is the sequential switch. Uh, this is something that we see in Eurorack, so many of you that are coming from that world will already be familiar with it. There's a clock input, and that allows you to either send one signal to up to four different locations, or four signals, up to four signals, to one location. So like the bidirectional router, the sequential switch is bidirectional. So input and output are flexible in this case, but once again, this needs to be the opposite of that. So if these are four outputs, then that needs to be an input. And if this is an output, those need to be four inputs there. So let's take a look at how it works. So we have up to four switches. Here we have a switch that allows us to choose as to how many of those we're going to be able to use in a, con in a given configuration. So I'm going to plug in a clock to run it. Slow it down a little. 
And in this mode, we're only using the top two. In the center position, we're using all four. And in the top position, we're using the first three. So let's start with that first three and we'll take our noise output and we'll run it again into the filter and then we will run the high pass version into input one, the band pass into input two, and the low pass into input three. And then we will output that. So you can hear it switching between the three different modes of the filter there. Now it's just switching between the top two. And if we put it in the middle section, when it gets to four, we're not hearing anything because there's nothing plugged into four. So just for fun, let's plug an oscillator into there. So you can hear all four of them working, and again, you can speed up the rate. Okay, now just to show you that it works the other way as well, and it's purely bidirectional, let's take the output of our oscillator and put it into the input here. And then we'll take the output of switch one, channel one, and put that into the mixer. And as you see, every time that it gets to one, then we're getting the output. Otherwise, we're not hearing anything. OK, let's take a look at the noise source. Now, the noise source delivers a couple of different really, really useful things. The first thing is that it'll deliver analog white and pink noise, but then it will also deliver some random voltages that we can use within a sample and hold circuit or as stepped voltages all by themselves. So first of all, here is our white noise output. And our pink noise output. Let's plug those into a filter. So we can get some classic wind type sounds. So now let's take a look down here at the stepped and random outputs. So these give you a couple of different flavors of uh, random voltages that get generated by either hitting the manual button here or by taking a trigger input, and every time it gets a pulse, it changes that. So let's take a look at this. We'll plug in an oscillator, and then we'll go into the stepped output. And then the random output. Let's hear what that sounds like with a pulse output with a pulse controlling it. So there's our stepped output. And our random output. What I'm hearing is that the stepped output is a more constrained range of random voltages. They're all sort of in the same pitch area. Whereas the random is giving us back and forth between high pitches and low pitches. Okay, lastly, let's take a look here at the sample and hold and source outputs on the noise source generator. Now these are used to be able to create sample and hold sources for a sample and hold to be able to sample from. Now unfortunately I don't have a sample and hold within my Serge system, but fortunately I do within my Eurorack system, a Depfer A148 dual sample and hold. So in order to be able to go back and forth between my banana world and my Eurorack world, I am using the fine prism circuits format jumbler. Uh, so you start by taking a ground output from the power supply of the Serge system. 
uh, and then that will supply the ground that you need for the Eurorack system, and then you just go back and forth between the banana jacks and the 3.5 millimeter jacks to be able to translate back and forth. So I have a pulse output from my serge system going to the trigger input of the sample and hold. And then here is the sample and hold output of our noise going into the sample and hold input of that system. And then finally, we are coming back from the system. This is the sample output, which we will then use to be able to drive the pitch of our oscillator. So we'll plug in our oscillator. Trigger is already going. And there we go. The sample and hold source is acting as a sample and source output for the dual sample and hold system. And once again, if we've got the source, it gives us a different flavor that just like the steps in the random have a wider pitch variation. Okay, now let's take a look at this absolutely awesome filter circuit that we have right here. Uh, this is a classic Serge filter. It is super useful. I only had one filter before this in my Serge system, and you can bet that I'm going to be building more of these with every panel that I build because they're so, they're so useful and they sound so good. So going through the system, we have high pass output, band pass output, and low pass output. This is our input signal right here with our input gain knob right there. Then we have our resonance or our Q amount right there. And then this is our filter cutoff knob right here. Then finally, there's a control voltage input to be able to control the amount of filter cutoff there. There is not a voltage controlled input for the Q, however. So we've already listened to it a couple of times, but listen, let's listen to it again really carefully. Let's start with our white noise output. Here's our low pass. Cue all the way off. Filter cut off all the way up. Awesome. Then let's listen to the band pass. And then finally the high pass. Oh, a little bit of issue there. DIY for you. Try the other one. All right, a little bit of DIY repair to figure out what's wrong with the high pass filter. Now let's listen to it with the Q. We can get it self-oscillating, get it there and get a really sharp. Resonance peak. It was a dark and stormy night in the mountains. Now, uh, we can actually ping this, so we can get the cue self-oscillating, and we'll just hit it with a pulse input instead. <laughs> 
and then we can actually drive the ping from something like a sequencer. So I'll take that same pulse, run it into the sequencer we were looking at earlier, and then tweak these bit a bit to be able to get. Okay, and finally, let's plug in a good old sawtooth wave and hear how the filter reacts to that. Here's low pass. Turn the cue all the way down. And then crank it up. Super groovy. Band pass. And then high pass. And interestingly enough, the high pass is not misbehaving now, which leads me to the conclusion that it was just freaking out a little bit with the noise input. Overall, just an awesome sounding filter and a very, very useful addition to my Serge system. Okay, so let's take a look at the gate. Uh, you can use this for two different things. You can use it as a standard VCA for audio signals, but you can also use it to be able to deform control voltages, which is pretty neat. We'll take a look at both of them. So let's start out by using it in its standard mode. We'll take the output of an oscillator and put it into the AC input right there, and then take the output of the VCA and run it into the mixer. And then we have a pulse that is driving an ADSR envelope, and we will plug that into the logarithmic input. We can use our gain to be able to adjust, to be able to maximize the amplitude without having it bleeding. So there it's bleeding. There it is, and we can start tweaking it. just like every ADSR in the world. Okay. Okay, so now here's an example of being able to use the gate to be able to modify a control voltage. So I'm gonna take a triangle LFO and run it into the pitch input of this oscillator. Very cool. So now what happens if I take it and run it into the gate and then have the output of the gate drive that same thing? And then tweak that by using the same ADSR we were using before. We can get all sorts of weird control voltage shapes that way. So that's my first Prism Circuits paper face panel. I can't wait to build my next one, which will have smooth and step generators, phasers, and more of those awesome filters. I learned a lot building this first one, and it will save me some hassle building the next one. All I can say is that if you are interested in exploring the 4U format, this is a great way to build or augment a system without breaking the bank. Plus, 
you get the satisfaction of knowing that you built a working, high-quality synthesizer that will bring you joy for years to come. So, that's it for this episode of Under the Big Tree. As always, if you like what I'm doing here, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. I do this channel for one reason only, to share my love and enthusiasm of electronic music and electronic music instruments with the community. So thank you for listening, and for now, this is Nick, signing off.